Eastside Online, what's up guys? We're so excited to have you with us this weekend. I'm joined by our lead pastor, Dave Hastings. And before we jump into things, I just want to remind you to check out the comments section right now and there's a link for our Digital Connect card. If this is your first time watching or if you have a prayer request or any questions about Eastside and who we are as a church, click on that link and fill out that card and somebody from our team will reach out to you. So Dave, I'm excited to have you on our pre-show again this week, and we are wrapping up this series, Dangers of a Socially Distant World, those three-week series, and this was the first one that you've had since you've come back from study break. So I just want to kind of get into the mind of Dave Hastings and what led you to having this series as your kickoff coming back. Well, that's probably been a bit of an evolution, I think, as I think about that early in uh, the study break time. I knew I wanted to do something about what we're facing in our culture today and this social distance terminology that probably none of us used it you know three months ago and uh, i knew i wanted to do something about that and what was striking me was this this idea that it seemed to be counter uh, to what god had called us as far as being together and god had created us to be in, in a relationship with each other and and god is very specific about how those relationships are to exist and how they're to function and it just sounded completely different from you know let's be separate from each other so I kind of had that general thought early in the uh, study break Mm -hmm. and so kind of put those general ideas together but Donnie man I'm telling you um, every week when I've gotten into the detail of it and I've started to study uh, the Word of God what it relates to the specific uh, topic that we're dealing with that it became more and more convicting to me um, about how the way God wants our human relationships to function is so completely different from how human relationships function in our society. Um, The culture of uh, humanity and the culture of God's kingdom are diametrically opposed to each other. And you can find that in how we relate to each other. And so that's come up every week. And this particular weekend, it is almost insanity. Particularly, I think, a lot because of the the stuff that we've seen happening during this week. Yeah. And, and you put that up against the heart of God to be kind to each other. That's a challenge. It is incredibly a challenge because we are so ingrained into operating the way our culture and and just as human beings how we're we're kind of ingrained about here's how we respond to particular situations and then the narrative of God's word I mean it's on the other end of the ocean yeah and, and so uh, it's been good for me personally kind of be reminded of that. But man, some really challenging truths in the Word of God that I believe that if we follow those, if we can jump out of our comfort zones and say, man, I'm gonna trust that God knew what God was talking about. What it does with relationships is beautiful. Yeah. But man, it's a, t- it's a tough jump. It is, I think for me, this, this series talking about encouraging one another, bearing with one another, and then this week being kind to one another, it, it, those are three topics that when, when you look at them on paper, they seem like, duh, we're supposed to do that stuff. But then with everything that's gone on in our society over the last months and even what's been going on here locally, I think whenever it, it's been preached over the last couple weeks, people have really sat back and said, I knew that all along, but now I'm challenged right. and now I'm convicted by that. Right. And knowing that that's how we need to be with one another. We, yeah. we do need to be encouraging. We need to be kind. We need to bear with one another. And if we do all of that, we, we get a better glimpse of that relationship that God designed in the very beginning. Yeah. And we can hopefully yeah. begin a healing process and, and just a, a more loving relationship with the people that we're around. Yeah. And the end result of that is that we finally find out why God asked us to do that because we are always better off, always better off his route. So yeah, that's what it's been about. It's been fun putting it together. Well, speaking of friendships, relationships and everything, we want to send it over to the commons right now where one of our good friends, Sarah, is out there and she has a very interesting question that she would like to ask today. All right, guys, we are hanging out in the commons right now and I have a super important question that I'm going to be asking people right now. 
Uh, Matea, what month do you think it's too soon to start listening to Christmas music? Uh, I don't like to listen to Christmas music, so all with the Bah humbug, get out of here. Next. <laughs> Dylan, w w when do you think it's okay to start listening to Christmas music? Um, I'm gonna go in November because, like, you have Thanksgiving still, so okay. not until after that. All right, one November. Okay. All right, Vic. When do you think it's too soon to start listening to Christmas music? Never. So you say you start listening to it in at Halloween? Well, yeah. Okay. About October. Jesus. We got in October. We're moving backwards. All right. Cool. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right, Crystal and Letha. When do you guys think Never. it's too soon to start listening to Christmas music? Never. I listen to it all year round. You literally listen to it all year round? Yeah. So, okay, we started at November and we ended up all the way back to the previous <laughs> Christmas. So, guys, I guess it's never too early to start listening to Christmas music. That's what Eastside says. There you go. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And I just have to say, I think I'm going to side with the people who say it is not time to listen to Christmas music yet. We definitely have to wait till we get through Thanksgiving, at least. I mean, way too soon. So I'm backstage right now in the tech room with Jeremy Johnson. He's one of the volunteers on the tech team. And Jeremy, just what do you love about being on the tech team here at Eastside? Uh, I just enjoy helping and putting the words on the screen. I'd like to sing, but it really just tells me to stay back here. So. <laughs> It's fun. Well, we love having you back here, man. You bring a lot of energy to it. And I guess we're getting ready to get things rolling, so you might want to go ahead and jump to your spot. Thanks. And we appreciate having appreciate you. It. And before we jump into things, I just want to remind you to make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this channel, to the page. Share this message, Eastside Online, with everybody that you're friends with on Facebook and YouTube, so that way people can continue to hear the message of the gospel. So I'm going to go ahead and send it over to Aquila right now, who's on stage, and we will get ready for worship. Let's all stand, put your hands together today. Come on. Let's sing out, Lord, how you love me.
here in Eastside in our student ministry, each year we have an annual theme. And with this theme, we try to focus in on something that is almost like our anthem for the year. And we base it on what our students need to hear, what we feel God is leading us to challenge them with. But this year we wanted to do something different. We wanted to give our students an opportunity to make their own theme. And almost like a crest or an image that they would focus on for the year. So we gave them some paint and some paint brushes and they were able to make an image here in our gym where our student ministry meets. And so you see in the background, we have all these different awesome images. We got some great artists here in our student ministry and, and they made it based on the, the, the needs of their group. There's one in particular that I thought would be perfect for today when talking about communion. It's actually one of my favorite verses and one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. It's Psalm 139. And we're going to give, the, give you the image right now of, of what that is. And I love it. It says, take the scenic route. But Psalm 139 is all based on the inescapable presence of God. And so it has verse 23 and 24. And this is what it says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. And so as we come into communion, I want us to be praying that prayer. God, search me, try me, see any anxious thought in me, see if there's anything hurtful, but I need you to lead me. I need you to take the scenic route. Take me where I need to go, not where I think I need to go, where you need to take me. And that's something we can do each and every week in communion. So as we do this, do not forget that challenge. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again that you want to take us on the path that isn't necessarily the easiest path. It's usually the terrain that is least traveled. And I pray right now as we come into communion and remember what you did, what you accomplished on, the, on that cross, that we are willing to follow you, no matter the cost. We love you, God. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for grace. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Our only hope in this world is in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Help us declare that right now. Come on. And I've been nailed by our Savior. And I fell fire from above And I've been down to that river I ain't the same I'm a prodigal return That's why I sing Oh, my hope is in Jesus And I've been washed by the blood. Amen. I'm no stranger to prayers alone. Cause I've worn shackles and chains.
with us all my hope. Come on. Said, all my hope is in Jesus. Oh, and I've been washed by the How we doing east side, huh? Man, I feel like I've been in church, okay? Wow, that was something else. But it's good to see you. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, we're just thrilled that you're in the house of God and believe that he sent you here to hear your worship and also to be impacted by his word. And I'm just really happy that you've come to be with us. I want to welcome our online campus as well. You guys are all over the place. And so we're here in Jeffersonville, Indiana, saying hello to you. And uh, you rock it too online. And we're just glad that we're all together to hear the Word of God and what He has to say to us at this time. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a preacher secret. And uh, all preachers know the secret that I'm about to share with you. And uh, so I'm going to let you kind of peek in a little behind the scenes to uh, times when guys like me write sermons and study for them. we got a lot of pastors on our staff that do the same thing. And here's a little trick of the trade that we always try. We always try to do our best at this. And that is that whenever we preach a series of messages... And we are almost always in a series at, at Eastside. And so that's three, four, five, six sermons, and it's called a series. And a little trick of the trade is that we always want the last one to be the grand slam. That's what we want. And we plan it that way. And so when we put those sermons together, we want each one to kind of bump up a little bit more and more in intensity, and then you get to the last one, and bam, hit it out of the park, bases loaded. All preachers try that. And so this week I sat down to develop this last message in our series, and I quickly realized that I botched it up really bad. Now, if you've been with us, you know we're in this short little three-week series, and the gist of it is this, this concept that we're battling this virus. We all know that, and we all know the drill, you know, six feet, mask, don't touch anybody. We all get that. We just got to do that, gang, so we can get past this thing. And, and so that's kind of where we're at. But the unintended consequence of that globally has been a separation of people. And not only a separation of people where it just seems like we're moving apart from each other, but it just, it just seems that we're, we're, we're doing this too. And then in the middle of all of that, this whole civil unrest issue kind of enters the equation. And if we're not apart, we're attacking each other. And so this, this teaching series kind of came in the gist of that, and, and we wanted to present the idea that the biblical narrative is the opposite of all that. That God intended us to be together, that he intended us to be intricately in connection with each other. The biblical narrative is that we treat each other in a positive, unifying way, not in a negative, dividing way. And so that's been kind of the gist 
of what we wanted to say in, in three messages. And in, and in the first two, we've kind of presented this idea that the Bible is very meticulous in saying, here's how we ought to treat each other. And man, it's different from how we're seemingly treating each other in the world. And so we picked one in the first week, and we picked another one last week, and my hope is that those kind of encouraged you and, and built you up as far as a relationship with each other, and the intent was that each one would get a little bit more in your business, and we'd come to this week, and we'd be talking Grand Slam. So I sit down at my desk this week, I'm going to put it all together, and, and we arrive at the last one, the Grand Slam, and here it is, B kind to one another. It's listed 23 different times in the New International Version of the New Testament, and there are all kind of variations to it, but essentially, if you had to wrap it all together, here's what being kind to each other means. To be friendly, to be neighborly. It is the heart and soul of God that we would learn to treat each other friendly, kindly. Now, I'm going to give you permission to do this because I'm going to be totally honest with you on this. Am I the only one in the room that thinks that sounds a little sissified? Am I it? Huh? And you, you know me, I like to preach with a little bit of power every once in a while. I think it's a sin to bore people with the Word of God. And, and so, so I come tonight, and I'm like, man, we're going to lay it on the line. We're going to do it. And, and, I, and I've got to tell you, would you just be nice to each other? Huh? Does that sound a little sissified to anybody other than me? You, you go home today, and, and then you get to work tomorrow, and people say, man, what did your preacher talk about? Oh, man, it was unbelievable. He told us to be nice to each other. Now that sound like, man, is that all you got, huh? If, if you're older than me, you remember these things. It's called a VCR tape. And some of you young people aren't gonna believe it. <laughs> it's gonna blow your mind. There is a movie on this thing, okay? And this one here is the American classic, Mrs. Doubtfire. And for some reason, I found it in an old uh, file cabinet in my basement this week. And uh, you, you, this is just craziness, okay? Um, they used to have this machine, and you could stick it in that machine, and that movie, <laughs> you think about the power of God, it would come on your TV. And there were stores everywhere that you could just go to and give them a couple bucks, and they'd let you have one of these things for the night. Now, if you were ever in that capacity, you know that often you pulled that VCR out of its box, and it had a little sticker there that said, be kind, rewind, right, huh? That's what I feel like I'm preaching tonight. Just be kind, rewind a little bit, huh? Think, man, God, is that all we got tonight? When I was a little guy, my uh, parents had this deal where they took us out to eat, our family, on Christmas Eve. And so we would go to the fanciest joint in town. And back in those days, man, we just didn't eat out much, okay? I just didn't go out. Nobody had the money that we got in nowadays, and so we didn't eat out. So Christmas Eve when we ate out, it was a big deal, man. And nowadays, people eat out all the time, okay, constantly eating out. Uh, Susan and I were talking the other day about, you know, where we're going to eat tonight. I said, you know, where you want to go? And she says, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Why, why don't we go somewhere we ain't been for a while? And I said, you mean we're eating in the kitchen tonight? So that wasn't very kind, was it, okay? So when I was a little guy... Um, my parents would get us all dressed up, and me and my siblings, and on Christmas Eve, we'd go to the fancy joy, and I can still see my mom and dad saying to us, now, now, be nice, be nice to each other here, be nice. And I feel like that's what I'm going to say tonight. And so I'm letting you in kind of behind the scenes a little bit in how preachers write sermons, because my intention was that I would come this weekend, and maybe we'd be talking grand slam stuff. And I looked down and said, oh, man, I planned for the last one for us to talk about how to be a little sissy and be nice to each other. And, and, and so all preachers who are 
really serious about it. I'm, I'm trying to make a joke about this, but I, I want you to, this concerned me. And so I just plopped down and prayed. And Tuesday afternoon, I spent some time with God, and I said, I, I must be missing something, God, because I'm not seeing it, man. I want something. I want, I want, some, I want some zeal, and, and I'm just not seeing where, where it's at. I'm missing something. And so I took those 23 different places, and I said, uh, I, doggone, I'm just going to take the time to do it. And, and dudes, I went down into every one of them, and I looked at them intently, every place they come up in the Bible. And what I found out was that I was missing it. That there are some times in which kindness is listed in the Bible, and it's really soft and gentle and kind of nice, just be friendly to each other. But then there are other times where it's like, man, I didn't see that. And what I found out was that I could preach on tithing and sexuality and the temperature of hell and put them all together, and it wouldn't hold a candle to the gut punch of learning to be kind. Because it's way more than just being nice to each other. So here, here's what I'd like to do for you in the next several minutes is I just want to tease you with a couple places in, in, the, in the text there where it, it comes out with this idea of how tough kindness is. And, and I've kind of worded it this way, that kindness isn't for sissies. That it's not sissified at all. And, and here's one time when you find that out. When, when you would prefer, when it would be your preference for you to benefit in a particular situation. When, when you want to get something back in return, that's when kindness is really big time stuff. I found this out in the Bible. I, I, man, I love this idea. Two different times in the Bible, in the New Testament, the word used for kindness is the same word they used when they named the city Philadelphia. We got a Philadelphia in our country now, and they had a Philadelphia in the New Testament. And the very same word they used for Philadelphia is the same word they used to translate uh, 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 friendliness and kindness in the New Testament. It is the word phileo, and so there you see the word Philadelphia. And what, what it really means is two people who are friends. They're friends to each other. So person A is uh, kind, uh, person B and so because of that, person B is kind to person A, and you just kind of got friendliness and niceness going back and forth with each other, and that's phileo. And the city of Philadelphia wanted us to believe that it's just a place of everybody being nice to each other. And so they called it Philadelphia, the city of, anybody know, brotherly love. Okay, we're friends with each other. Now, that's how we think of kindness. That's how all of us in this room believe kindness is, is that I'm going to be kind to you because you're kind to me. And because you're kind to me, I'm going to be kind back to you. And it describes our best friends. That's why we're kind to our friends. But let me ask you this. Would you be kind to somebody who is unable to be kind back to you? Would you display niceties to someone who is incapable of giving those to you in return? Would you be kind to people knowing that you won't benefit anything from it? There's a beautiful little story in the Bible about uh, two leaders of the early church, Peter and John. And, and Peter and John are kind of going along in their, their ministry as leaders of the church. They come across this guy who is unable to walk. He cannot walk. He's totally paralyzed. And so they claim the power of Jesus and they heal the man. And he stands up and he starts to walk and jump around. If you were a little kid in Sunday school, you remember hearing it. He went walking and leaping and praising. Am I saying that? Okay. You're going to go to bed tonight and pray. Walking and leaping and praising, put it in your face. Now, and now here's the cool thing is that as soon as that happened, Peter and John got arrested. They got arrested for preaching the name of Jesus. And so the next day when they appear before their first trial in front of the courts, notice what 
Peter said in Acts chapter four, verse nine, look at it. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple. We learn from that an element of what it means to be kind to another person, and that is to do something nice, to do something friendly, to serve somebody who has no ability at all to bring anything back to me. I do it just because I'm kind. Now, I wish I had the time, and I know I don't, to go back to last week and bring up something that I talked about, but, but I've got to at least mention it in passing. We Christians do things differently than people who are not Christians. That we, we don't live like other people live. We are completely different. The way we talk, the things we do, the things we don't do, the things we believe, the attitudes we profess, everything about us is different than people who don't know Jesus. And so when you think about that, what that means is that applies even to kindness. Because the general understanding of kindness is I'm going to be nice to you and friendly to you, assuming you're going to be nice and friendly back to me. That's why we've got all the friends that we have. But Christians aren't like that. We do things that nobody else does. And watch this. We look for opportunities to be kind when we will not benefit anything. And so we hear about that stuff around. Anybody remember hearing the phrase, random acts of kindness? I remember times there were weeks of random acts of kindness. Watch this. That's us. That's the stuff we do. Have you ever happened to be in a, in a drive up somewhere and the pay it forward thing happens and, and so somebody pays for your food, you're behind them and you think that's pretty cool and then you get in line and you pay for the, the food of the person behind you and then you move on for the can never thing. That's what we do. That's who we are. We do that, expecting nothing in return. That is kind. Now, it doesn't count if you sit over to the side and wait for a car that only has one person and jump in front of them. That's not being kind, okay? That's being cheap. <laughs> we, we, we look for opportunities to be kind knowing we ain't get nothing back. You ever given an anonymous gift? Just gave it to somebody and they'll never know that you, that's, that's us, guys. That's what we do. One of the most moving things this church has done over the past few years, it's going to sound self-serving and it really isn't, is anonymously this church gives our staff at Christmas time dozens and dozens and dozens of gift cards. And so we have a little party as a staff and we walk out of there. I think last year I had a stack of gift cards this thick. have no idea who, the, who gave them. And so my wife and I have learned through the years, whenever we use one of those at a restaurant somewhere, we pray. God, you know who gave this to us. We just want to pray favor upon them. We know who they are. We pray in favor. So if you want my wife and I to pray favor on you, you know what you got to do to take care of that. Well, one year, when we were all done, we were looking at our cards, and, and, and I had one from Lowe's, and there was a guy on our staff next to me, and he was talking about something. Oh, man, I got to get something at Lowe's. And I said, well, here, dude, just take it. I'll take one of yours. So I gave him the Lowe's card, and I took a restaurant card somewhere, and about a week later, he came up, and he goes, dude, we got ripped off, man. He goes, whoever gave that Lowe's card, it was used. It only had $3.17 on it. And I said, oh, man, that's terrible. But the restaurant, man, the meal was awesome, just so you know that. <laughs> now, if you gave the Lowe's card, you're a rascal. <laughs> if you gave the restaurant card, you are kind. Here's what the Bible says. That's just who we are. It's more than I'm going to be your friend because you're my friend. I'll be nice to you because you're nice to me. No, I'm going to look for opportunities to be kind when I know I ain't getting nothing out of this. Now, ask yourself, when's the last time you did that? And I made myself deal with that this week when I wrote this. And I cannot remember the last time I did that. Because I'm real kind 
when you're kind to me. Anybody else there? But we're not like them. So now kindness is starting to carry a little bit of punch to me. I'm thinking, man, that's, that's kind of that's a little bit closer to grand slam. I don't know if it's quite grand slam, but I hit a home run with that. God, you, okay, I'm catching that. And then God showed me another in the 23 where kindness just kind of jumps into another arena. And that is when I'm kind, when I would rather fight you. Some might go, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> So I'm going to be kind to you when I'd rather punch you in the nose. So let me show you a series of three verses. I just want to read them real quick. I want you to try to pay attention to a thread that goes through all those verses. They're unconnected verses. They're different letters, different cities, different people that it was written to. But there's a thread through every one of them. Just see if you can catch them. Look at this first one from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says this. When we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and everyone else. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. There's a thread through those unrelated passages which indicates it is the will of God for all people at all times. And it's this, that kindness is the biblical approach to conflict. Now, I don't know if anybody heard that. Kindness is the biblical approach to conflict. And what we're talking about is at the highest level of what it means to be kind as a believer. I'm not talking about folks in the world because we're not like the folks in the world. We're different. We're different. And so for those of us who walk with Jesus, the highest level of kindness is I am going to be friendly and kind and nice to you when deep down I'd rather just bloody your nose. Anybody there? Huh? Anybody? Am I it? Am I the only bomb in the room? Huh? That's what kindness is. And so 1 Corinthians says, you talk bad about me behind my back? I'll talk kindly about you. 1 Thessalonians says, you do me wrong? I'm going to be kind to you. 2 Timothy says, you want to argue? I'm just going to be nice to you. Now see, gang, somewhere along the line, we've got to... We've got to deal with this because I know none of us are dummies here. That approach cuts against the grain of what we are as human beings. The Bible says it is our flesh, our our carnal nature as human beings, who we really are as human beings. And when people attack us, when there are enemies, when they do us wrong, our flesh, our carnal nature wants to fight. That was settled way before you were born. Number three and number four population in the world. Number three and number four. Remember that, just three and four. All it took was three and four, Cain and Abel, and they learned how to deal with conflict, and Cain just killed him. And so that became set in the carnal, human, fleshly nature of human beings. And no matter how great a person you are, deep, way down inside of us, when somebody attacks, when somebody does us wrong, our response is, then I'm coming back at you. I mean, who here hasn't said, I have had it up to here? Because I'm ready to explode now. And so what the Bible does is comes across that and says, that's not how we react to that. That's not what we do. We are kind instead. I I remember to this day, uh, Teddy Saylor. And I don't remember why I remember Teddy Saylor. I don't remember why this, this, this story is so vivid in my mind, but I'm either in fifth or sixth grade. I don't know which one, but I'm one of those because I know the school I'm at. I'm at Oaklawn Grade School. And Teddy and me are not happy with each other. I couldn't tell you any idea why, as a million years ago, I don't know. But here's how my teacher handled it. 
He knew we were having a problem with each other. And so Mr. Hetzmanberger was his name. The only reason I'm telling you his name is because I think he's dead now. I think I saw it a couple of years ago that he was over. So because of that, I'm going to say his name. So Mr. Hetzenberger seen we're having a problem, and he did something. we got a lot of teachers in the room. If you did this, you'd be in jail by nighttime. Mr. Hetzenberger said, all right, let's go. We got out of the class. We went out onto the playground, Oakland grade school. I lived about a block away. He put us in a great big circle, all of us. Said, hey, things get in here. Say they're getting here. We got in the middle of the circle. He said, go at it. Knock each other silly. Go. And he encouraged everybody in the class to cheer us on. And if I close my eyes, I can hear it. Hit him, haste. Do him in, sailor. They were going crazy. And we just looked at each other <laughs> and started crying. Crying like little girls. Just crying. And Mr. Hesbenberger said, you couple of big babies, get back in class and get over it. Now, he'd be in jail today, but I think he knew what he was doing. I think he knew we wouldn't carry it out. And so see, if your intent, when you come into conflict, is to lash back. And, and Cain just killed his brother. And I just got in a fight with Ted Saylor in a circle. But for you, it might be criticism of your spouse because you just can't take it anymore. Or it might be raising your voice, or it might be seeking revenge, or it might be gossiping, or it might be spewing out divisive opinions on social media. And so I'd ask you about all that stuff that we get into because it's our carnal nature. Let me ask you, and I really want you to deal with this. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? And so God shows up on the scene and says, I got another idea. It's called kindness. So when they attack, you be kind. When they talk bad about you, you talk good about them. When they do you wrong, you do them right. And you say, Dave, why in the world would I ever do that? Why would I ever do that? Because it works. Because it works. Let me show you a couple places about kindness in the Bible real quick. We'll be done here in a few minutes. That'll show you the power of kindness when you'd rather fight. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 4. It talks about God's kindness to us. And notice what it says. God's kindness leads you toward repentance. This is the gospel message, that I let him down and I disappoint him and I probably anger him at times and he has every right in the world just kind of end it with me, he's done with me, I've done the same thing 15 times this week, he's had it with me and the grace and the love of God says, no, that's how I'm going to treat you, I'm going to be kind to you, Dave. That's the gospel message. And when I understand it, that a loving, caring, compassionate, sensitive, graceful, kind God wants to be for me when he has every right in the world to be against me, when I understand who he is and how he works in my life, what's that do to me? It changes my heart. It softens me. It encourages me to worship him and love him and follow him. See, I don't follow God because I'm afraid of God. I follow God because I love him. And the reason I love him is because he loves me. Watch this. The kindness of God changed me. It works the same way here. That if you've attacked me and I attack you back, all that did was surmount a bigger attack. But if you attack me, watch this, and I am kind to you, what does it do? It changes you. And just being kind doesn't solve the issue. If you're in conflict with somebody and you go see them and you just be kind and your issue isn't taken care of, but watch this, over time, the heart of that person changes so that you can deal with the issue. Does that make sense to anybody? Conflict being responded to with conflict doesn't work, but conflict that receives kindness changes them. Now watch this. Look at this verse. 
It's found embedded into the first chapter of 2 Peter. It says, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep that verse up there for a second because here's what it says. Do you want to be effective in your faith? Do you want to be productive in your faith? Do you want your faith in Jesus to be the very best that it can possibly be? Then what Peter said is there are some qualities make sure that are in your life. You get these qualities in your life, you're going to be effective, you're going to be efficient, you're going to be everything God wants you to be. And so if we backed up in the verses a little bit, we'd find out that he mentioned seven qualities. Can anybody guess what one of them is? Kindness. Watch, watch. When I am kind, it will change you and it will change me. The highest order of kindness is to do that with people whom you'd rather fight with. I had lunch with um, my wife Susan today. We were taking an hour outside and just enjoying the beautiful weather and having lunch together. And I, I said, man, it is crazy. It's amazing how God works to me sometimes that in the week that we've had here in this area of our country where cameras are now on us from all over the world. And from yesterday afternoon, since the Attorney General has um, revealed his findings with the grand jury in uh, Ms. Taylor's case ever since yesterday afternoon and now we look at where we're at today in in that 24 hours and and all that stuff, I I said to Susan, I said, it is insanity to me that God knew long ago all of that. And so everything you've witnessed over the last hour was decided long ago. And Aquila and Jennifer sang at the depth of her soul that my hope, the only hope I have is what? Jesus. Jesus. And I'm going to preach on kindness. You can't even write that script. And so I'm talking with Susan about how unusual it is that, and how how weird, just kind of awkward it is that, that here I am. And all of us have watched all day yesterday and all night. And we saw every emotion in the world, heartbreak and agreement and anger and violence. So last night, I'm, I'm kind of gelling, and um, I'm flipping through the news channels and seeing things, and there's an interview with a lady going on. And I, I wished I would have wrote her name down or where she was from. I, I couldn't tell you anything about her. I, I don't remember that because I was fixated on what she was saying. She was being asked about this whole situation that the greater... Louisville metro areas in the middle of, and she just kind of gave her thoughts on it, and it went on for probably, I I imagine, maybe 10, 12 minutes she spoke. She didn't take a breath, just came out for 10, 12 minutes. And on every single point she made, I disagreed. We weren't even close in the same camp of opinion. But while she talked about things that she believed that mattered to her greatly, listen carefully. She was kind. And I'm not going to be a phony here. I'm like everybody else in this room. There have been times when I've been frustrated with opinions that aren't in sync with mine. Facts that I know are not facts, hypocrisy and lies, and I get frustrated with that and I get mad about that. And when she spoke and said all of the things that I stand against, I didn't feel any of that toward her because she was kind. 
And here's what I thought. Sister, I don't know who you are. But I think you and I could sit down together and we could figure this all out. Because you have changed my heart as I've watched your heart change. Kindness is the beginning step. And you can't choose that for the White House, but you can choose that for your house. Sissies will never understand that. Father, your word is eternal in its nature. What made a difference a couple of thousand years ago is as real today as it ever was. I feel with my, my family here that I, I, need to, I need to vocally and publicly repent to you for my failure to see the power of your word no matter what it says. But I thank you for the revelation of what you meant when you ask your people to be kind. It's way more than being a friend. I don't know that we're going to change the world. But there's a a group of several dozen people in this room that can walk out of here and then start showing some light in a dark, dark world by being kind. I can't imagine how much you want that, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. So Dave just finished wrapping up. Uh, the sermon series that we've been in, Dangers of a Socially Distanced World. And as I sat in and listened to that sermon, I can't help but feel the conviction because everything he was talking about, him and I talked about it just before the the service and kind of laid out what happened in the sermon series and how all of the topics, the encouragement, the bearing with one another, the kindness, all of them on the surface sound so simple And we all know that we're supposed to do those things. But just like he alluded to, with with everything that's going on in in our culture right now, and especially here locally in the Kentuckiana area, I think this service takes it to a whole new level of what it actually deep down means to be kind. It's so easy to be kind to people um, who are, are going to reciprocate and return that, but are we willing to be able to sit down with other people that maybe we don't share the same ideology with, maybe we don't share the same views on political things or on social things, are we able to sit down with people and show kindness to them? Because just like Dave said, whenever we introduce kindness into the conversation, it changes me, it changes you, it changes the entire circumstance. So I challenge you this week, you're going to have times where where you're going to be able to either show kindness or to not show it. And I challenge you to show kindness at every opportunity. Don't forget that there are opportunities to give online if you haven't already for this weekend. And next week we begin our new series, The Playlist. So we hope to see you back next weekend.